Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Larkin. I am the CAL FIRE Unit Chief for the San Mateo Santa Cruz uh, Unit. Um, welcome to the last of two uh, CAL FIRE CZU Lightning Complex community meetings uh, that are being held. Uh, tonight's meeting um, uh, will be presented to Supervisorial District 5, uh, focusing on the San Lorenzo Valley uh, and the communities of Felton, Ben Loman, Brookdale, Boulder Creek, Zioni, and Scotts Valley. Um, the first meeting um, <clears throat> of this two-part series was held last night for Supervisorial District uh, 3, focusing on the Bonnie Dune, Davenport, and North, Co North Coast areas. Um, if you are from a different part of the county, uh, um, this information that's being uh, provided uh, at each of the meetings is exactly the same presentation. So um, if you were here last night, uh, you're going to see the exact same presentation that you saw uh, last night. Um, First thing I would like to start out with is a, a moment of silence uh, in recognition of Mr. Tad Jones, uh, who tragically lost his life during the CZU Lightning Complex fire. And thank you for that moment of silence. Uh, I would like to apologize to you all um, for how long it's taken Cal Fire to hold these community meetings. Uh, normally we would hold these types of uh, community meetings uh, in person and prior to the full control of the uh, incident uh, to allow our CAL FIRE incident management team uh, to participate uh, in this meeting. Uh, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the precautions uh, that we have to take with that, we were unable to meet that goal. Um, we had come to a point that we could no longer hold off uh, conducting these meetings uh, due to these uh, restrictions. Um, so we found a new platform uh, to deliver this, uh, this meeting. Uh, this meeting will provide a incident summary and lessons learned. Uh, it is not meant to be a after action review. Our presentation is approximately 50 minutes, five zero minutes in length. Uh, and at the conclusion, we will have an answer and question period. Uh, we're asking everybody to please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, I know these have been challenging times for us all. And I know you all have uh, lost a lot. Uh, a lot of you have lost your homes and emotions are high. Uh, I would like to say um, that we uh, are empathetic to your losses um, as we have also had several of our uh, own firefighters that who've suffered these same losses. Uh, I'm requesting that uh, all of us be courteous to each other during the question and answer segment uh, so that we can try to get to as many of the questions as possible. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that this is a live meeting broadcast uh, on community TV. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists for tonight. Um, Cal Fire Deputy Chief Nate Armstrong will be co-presenting with me tonight. Uh, Cal Fire Deputy Chief Jonathan Cox, who will be assisting us in the facilitation of the answer on question session. And then from the Sheriff's Office, we have Chief Deputy uh, Chris Clark. And then from the Santa Cruz County Office of Emergency Services, we have uh, Michael B. Um, Supervisor McPherson is listening into these, uh, this broadcast, uh, but will not be participating as a panelist. Um, I'd also like to take an opportunity to thank Community TV uh, for pro providing us this venue uh, to be able to deliver this meeting. So we're going to go ahead and start off here. Uh, I'd like to just uh, um, start off by painting a picture um, uh, of what, what occurred here. Um, so at approximately uh, 3 a.m. on August 16th, 2020, um, a lightning storm made landfall uh, that generated approximately 12,000 lightning strikes across California. Uh, that series of lightning strikes caused more than 880, I'm sorry, 585 fires across the state of California. And of that, 24 of those fires became major incidents. 300 plus lightning strikes hit directly here in San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. Um, from those 300 lightning strikes, we had 27 confirmed fires that had been ignited in the unit from uh, that storm that had passed through. Uh, and just to kind of paint a picture of our daily uh, uh, staffing here in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, better known as CZU, um, our staffing consists of 13 fire engines that are staffed uh, on a daily basis during the, our peak fire season, uh, two bulldozers, we have three fire crews, and then we have four shift battalion chiefs uh, that provide overhead support uh, for approximately 455,000 state responsibility acres uh, or state lands that we protect here in the two counties. 
Um, leading up to this, we had been experiencing uh, drought condi conditions for several years, as we're all aware of. Um, <clears throat> recently, the weather uh, leading up to the weeks uh, prior to this, we had seen um, uh, temperatures in excess of 100 degrees, uh, and our relative humidities uh, had been in the single digits and as low as 4% humidity uh, leading up to the fires. Um, and the week prior to the fire, we had no coastal influence that is kind of our uh, helps with our humidity recoveries at night uh, leading up to the, uh, the fire event. <clears throat> so before I turn the presentation over to Deputy Chief Armstrong, I wanted to just take uh, a moment to, um, uh, to be very clear to everybody. Um, every decision that we make and every action that we take have three main priorities uh, that we uh, make that we use in our decision making process. Uh, those are the protection of life, protection of property and environment and in that order. So I just want to emphasize to everybody the last thing that any of us ever wanted to occur uh, in an incident like this is to have somebody die or for people to lose their homes. Uh, so when we base our decisions, uh, we base them on those three, uh, those principles uh, and priorities, life, property, and the environment. So at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Deputy Chief Armstrong. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Chief Larkin said, my name is uh, Nate Armstrong. I'm the Deputy Chief for uh, CAL FIRE here in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, uh, overseeing uh, our state operations and overall operations within Santa Cruz County for us. Um, so I wanna take you guys through uh, just some operational uh, kind of components in the early days, the first couple of days of the fire, really before it grew into what everybody uh, knew it to be. So uh, this whole lightning siege really started for us kind of the day before on August the 15th. Um, what you're seeing on the screen right now is our, the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit lightning plan. And we won't go into massive detail on this. It's just to illustrate, um, we do have a plan for events just such as this. And we call it an LCA, a lightning coordination area plan. And basically what it does is it breaks things down for us uh, to go into a different mode from our day-to-day -day operations and really be able to track uh, multiple strikes uh, get folks out to assess those strikes and hopefully be able to staff any small fires and keep them small. Uh, so uh, the day before, like I said, on August 15th, we, we knew that this lightning was coming. Uh, we didn't know to the extent that it would be, but uh, just um, to reinforce that everybody, we had sent, that, sent out this plan, made sure everybody was refreshed on it, knowing that we would likely be following it the next day. And we absolutely did. Uh, we followed the plan to a T. It was well implemented. Uh, it was uh, well exercised. Uh, unfortunately, we just didn't have the resources to fully staff all of the fires like we would have wished. Um, so that, that's all I'll really go. Uh, I just want to touch on this lightning plan really quick. So um, early morning, uh, Sunday, August 16th, uh, by the time we got up or about 0600 in the morning, uh, or sorry, 6 a.m., uh, we had 27 fires, uh, active fires in the unit. We were receiving hundreds uh, of 911 calls. And I'm sure some of the folks uh, on, the, on this uh, call tonight may have been, uh, you may have seen a smoke plume and called 911. So typically what happens is as the sun comes up, more people are getting up, these uh, smoke plumes we get to be more visible and, and we get dozens if not hundreds of calls per fire. So uh, significant strain on our system. Uh, early that morning, uh, our uh, duty chief uh, for the unit uh, instituted what we call a staffing pattern, and that was to hold all of our personnel on duty. Uh, that would be the beginning of what was uh, well over a month before uh, most folks had a single day off. So uh, we held all our personnel on duty. We staffed every extra piece of equipment that we had from reserve engines to uh, county engines that we uh, administered through contracts. Uh, we also called all of our volunteer companies that uh, CAL FIRE uh, administers in Santa Cruz and San Mateo counties and just to, uh, just to have them staff uh, their equipment as they were available because we knew we were gonna need the help. Uh, obviously, uh, our uh, local cooperators throughout the county were, were also involved as we started to fight uh, some of these fires. Uh, it got down to the extent where we, we had uh, folks in, in pickup trucks with uh, hand tools just to be able to get people out uh, to find these fires and really assess what we had. The next slide, please, Chief. 
So um, what I want to illustrate a, a couple of things with this slide. So um, the photo that you're looking at is uh, with the exception of one that I should have added, but it's too late now, so I'll tell you about it. Um, these are all the fires that uh, most people uh, that are on the call tonight probably never heard of. These are all the fires that we extinguished within about the first 24 hours. So most of the fires were small. We were able to catch them. Uh, we were able to contain them and put them out or, or at least get them in those early stages. Um, and a couple of notable fires on here. Uh, if you can see the 3 11, right, right there on Chief's cursor, um, that was in the community of Zianti. That was a little better than 10 acres. It was in a very well populated area. Um, and uh, our, our Cal Fire Resources, uh, Zianti Fire Protection District, uh, were on that fire for a couple of days, but that was extinguished or contained at least in the, in the first day. Uh, the 3 10 was in the China Great area. Again, that was, um, that was, that was, in a semi-populated area, that was that was a, a, an almost immediate threat to structures, but that was also uh, extinguished in the first day. One other fire that didn't make this map it was the Waranella fire, and that is um, just south of that uh, three 22 on the on the north coast, uh, um, north of Davenport. That was probably the most immediate threat. Um, aside from that three 11 um, to the communities of Davenport and um, I'm sorry, uh, Bonnie Dune. That was about 120 acres uh, by the time we contained it the next day. Uh, but that was uh, fully contained by the time that this fire really blew up to what most people know. So anyway, like I said, I'd just like to illustrate the point of uh, the big fire that everybody uh, uh, came to know was really uh, out of three fires that grew together. The vast majority of them were extinguished. Uh, the other thing I want to touch on really quick while we're on this slide is the name, because we've got a lot of questions about the name. How do we come up with CZU August Lightning Complex? So there's uh, 21 uh, operational units uh, throughout the state of California for CAL FIRE. Uh, the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit that we're all in here uh, is called CZU. It's a, a three-letter identifier that all the units have. So when we have a... Um, multiple fires that we manage under one structure. It's called a complex. So you can see the number of fires that are on this map. We can't, you know, name each and every one of those things. So we group them all together and we call, and for this, uh, it was called the CZU August Lightning Complex. So just a little semantics, but we get asked quite a bit. So I figured I'd cover it. The next slide, please, Chief. So this is one other fire uh, that semi should have been on that map uh, that I just showed you. This is the Waddell fire. And, th and this picture was taken from uh, San Mateo County looking south on Highway 1. Uh, and if you aren't terribly familiar with the area, this was uh, just north of the Waddell Creek drainage, the Rancho Del Oso area. And uh, this fire was actually the most immediate threat, if you will. Granted, it, it wasn't a looming threat by any means because it was a small, um, slow uh, growing fire. But this was the uh, closest fire to the communities of, of last chance. Uh, we had this fire staffed from the first day on the 16th, and uh, we had it uh, nearly contained. We had uh, folks on it, like I say, continuously, and it was almost contained on the 18th when uh, all of uh, when those three other fires really grew into into the large fire. And unfortunately, we had to uh, pull the resources off of the Waddell fire to go uh, help fight fire in, in last chance. Next slide, Chief. So moving into uh, Monday, August 17th, what we really had was uh, there were those handful, uh, there were a bunch of those little small fires that unfortunately we still have to have uh, some sort of resource on. Uh, we can't just walk away from fires after they're deemed out. We really need to patrol them for a day or two to make sure that they don't come back uh, um, when, when no other resources are around. So we do our best to spread those resources out. Sometimes an engine can patrol two or three fires. But uh, what we really had on, on day two on the 17th was five fires that we were staffing in, in a larger capacity. Uh, two of those being the Waranella and the Waddell fire. Uh, and then the other three were in uh, San Mateo County in uninhabited uh, forested areas. And you can see here on this map, uh, two of those fires named under that, that lightning complex uh, plan 
was the 5-15 and the 5-18. The other one that's off this uh, map that does come into play is the 5-14. Those are the three that really grew in, merged and grew to be the, the large fire. So uh, all of these fires were 80 plus acres, uh, anywhere from 800 or sorry, 80 to 200 acres. Um, with the exception of those two that were on the on the Santa Cruz County coast, uh, these ones that were out in uh, the, the forested lands of San Mateo County were really inaccessible. They're all on heavy timber. Uh, they were all uh, moving at a slow rate of spread uh, at this time on the 17th still. The one major thing, and you're gonna continue to hear it, was we had limited resources. We really had a limited capacity to actually staff these fires. So moving into uh, the 17th, we actually had the same folks that had been uh, up since 3 a.m. on uh, the day before on the 16th are still staffing these fires on the 17th because we just couldn't get uh, enough resources in, um, in into the county uh, due to the drawdown throughout the state. So uh, we were placing um, large resource requests. Unfortunately, those uh, requests largely went unfilled, uh, again, just because of the, the volume of fires throughout the state. Uh, one thing I'll indicate, so this map that you guys are looking at is the actual uh, branch director or, or, or field supervisor's map that he was using that day. And you might be able to see that pink outline uh, that kind of surrounds those two fires. And that goes along some ridges, other topographical features and roads. Uh, that, that was his planned containment. Uh, that was what he felt uh, that if he had the resources that he needed, this, is, this, this would be a, um, a reasonable uh, containment box to, to uh, contain this fire. Unfortunately, we, we just didn't have those resources available to us. Next slide, Chief. So here's just an aerial photo. One thing we did get on the 17th, uh, we, we had the ability to get a couple of helicopters here, which was really pretty impressive because there, there weren't a whole lot available in the state and we were lucky to get them. Just because of the inaccessibility of these fires, we knew that aircraft was gonna be uh, critical if we could just help uh, keep these fires at bay until we could get ground resources on them. So in this photo, um, you can see, um, just by that smoke production, it was it was uh, an understory burn. So what we mean by that is that's all that um, ground litter and fuel, basically all the dead things that have been falling out of trees for dozens, uh, going on nearly a hundred years because a lot of this area uh, doesn't have recorded fire history. We, we don't have record of wildfires in those areas. So that's all of that stuff that's laying on the forest floor. Uh, that's actually a, a good thing in this respect. You can see that next bullet point where it says no crowning. So what we talk about with a crown fire is um, not just a single tree burning or one or two trees burning, but that's when all of the tree tops are burning and it's going for you know very quickly from tree to tree to tree to tree. The crowning is, is really the, the activity that some folks unfortunately uh, saw late uh, the night of the 18th or moving into the 19th, even a little bit still in the 20th. Those crown fires are uh, moved so rapidly and forcefully that there, there's nothing we can do about them until that fire comes back down to the ground. Unfortunately, on the 17th, uh, one thing that further hampered our ability to get additional resources was that there's there were some other fires in the Bay Area, and I'll talk about them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but they really grew exponentially. We had a, a fire to the east of us in Santa Clara, as well as uh, a fire that was rapidly expanding um, in the North Bay area, uh, Sonoma County, uh, that were in that fire particularly is in a well-populated area already. And so that really uh, drew some resources that would not become available to us. Next slide, Chief. So again, on the 17th, uh, ha having those uh, helicopters available to us is, is a great tool. Um, it, it gave us the ability to get in the air and get some good uh, aerial reconnaissance. So we're able to fly the fire as, and, and really see their locations and what the, the threats were at that time and what the projected threats were uh, to be over the next couple of days. Um, at that point, we could tell that those fires in the forested lands were, were gonna give us some, some challenges. Uh, to, to get into once we could get the resources pulled off of these other smaller fires. We knew that we were going to be committed to those for, for at least a few days, or so we thought. And so we requested a type three incident management team uh, that day. And that, that 
uh, incident management team is, is a interagency team uh, of individuals here in the South Bay area. Uh, and the main focus of that is just to help us uh, with some of the planning and logistical functions as far as tracking resources, putting together our daily plans, uh, supporting the firefighters logistically um, with all the tools and supplies and everything that they need. We continued to uh, request additional resources uh, between uh, Monday the 17th and uh, moving into the morning of the 18th uh, where the fire would eventually blow up that evening. Uh, we had re uh, resource requests for over 150 uh, fire engines uh, that we would never get. So um, on the 17th, we we're also uh, beginning to engage a little more heavily with um, the sheriff's offices, um, uh, county administrative offices and uh, OES functions for both counties, uh, knowing that this would uh, likely be a lasting event. Still at this time, uh, those fires just weren't moving fast and uh, you'll see uh, in a couple of our progression slides that those first couple days for the amount of fires we had just wasn't a ton of acreage, at least not in, uh, in our minds. Next slide, Chief. So here's a map of, of the five fires that we had that day uh, on the 17th that were still active for us. Um, you see the Waranella down uh, at the very bottom of the map there. I don't know if it's covered by uh, your guys' little zoom functions. Um, you can see the Waddell on that North Santa Cruz County coast. And then you can see those three fires that I've been mentioning that really grew to merged, grew together to be the large fire. So on the 17th, still, they were, they were still in San Mateo County. They were relatively small. I'll show you a graphic in a minute that um, shows that uh, the topography they were sitting in is, was actually pretty favorable for us. Uh, but those three fires, that 5, 14, 15, and 18 were the ones that would really grow to give us a, a lot of trouble. They were also um, at that point near um, uh, populated areas of San Mateo County. So those were, um, were really where we were keeping an eye on at that point. And next slide, Chief. So a couple of things with this map. Number one, uh, uh, I hope that you guys can kind of ingrain this map in your mind because we're going to show you this map a couple of other times throughout the presentation as the fires begin to grow and it might uh, help you kind of gain a grasp of just how much the, the, they were growing each day. Um, again, you see the Waranel and the Waddell, and you see those three fires. Now those couple, the 5-18 the and the 5-15 are those ones uh, furthest on the north. And this is a, a topographical relief map, so it shows us like uh, mountains and valleys and so forth. And what we see with this map is those two fires are sitting on the lee side of, of, of that ridge, and they were just slowly backing down. And again, we showed you those pictures, but um, they were slowly backing down through that ground fuel and, and um, uh, just down into that uh, little river drain. I believe that's a Pescadero Creek drainage. Um, and you can see that that day, that was a, a total of 861 acres at that point on the 17th. Next slide, Chief. So I'll hand it back to uh, Chief Larkin here uh, in a second. He'll take you through the next couple days of the fire, uh, but I'll leave you with this photo. Um, this was taken late in the day on the 17th. So this is uh, uh, just about 24 hours uh, before the fire really began to uh, merge and really begin to move quickly in, in, into our populated areas, uh, particularly into the San Lorenzo Valley and Bonnie Dune. Uh, and what we can see from this photo like I say, it's still, uh, it's that understory burn. Um, it was burning fairly, fairly uh, cleanly in that. We don't see a lot of crowning in this. One thing that we do see in this is that smoke's really starting to lay down. And granted, this was taken in the evening uh, when that offshore wind would pick up, but it was really starting to lay down and that does a couple of things for us. It, one, it's an indicator that eventually we, we would see that that wind would really pick up and drive the fire. But the other thing that happens with that wind when the smoke lays down is it makes it difficult for us to uh, fight uh, fire with aircraft just where, when they aren't able to see and, and get into particular areas. So uh, just another challenge that we had to deal with. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chief. Thanks, Chief Armstrong. Um, so I'm gonna kind of carry you through the, the next couple of days. Uh, on the 18th, um, uh, the three fires uh, that were burning in San Mateo County that we had referenced, uh, 518, uh, 513, and 514, um, uh, they continued to burn in a southerly direction, uh, as you can see indicated in this picture. Uh, and mostly it was still an understory burn. We did have some isolated trees that would torch out, uh, but for the most part, the fire was still on the ground. Uh, it had not reached into the canopies. 
Um, but we did notice that the fire did start to burn in a little bit greater intensity uh, here on the 18th. Um, and based on these indications here, um, uh, I just want to give retrospect to, you know, uh, CAL FIRE um, has a, a six incident management teams uh, that help us manage these large scale incidents. Um, multiple teams had already been deployed in the state on other uh, fires that were much larger in size than the and what we were dealing with here in the unit. We had already had our type three incident management team that had helped stand up our organization here. Um, but we went ahead and make the request for uh, a type one incident management team uh, to come into the unit to help uh, facilitate uh, the management of uh, this incident uh, as our complexity started to grow. Um, next slide here, sorry about that. Um, so as we progressed on the 18th, um, fire activity started to increase um, throughout the day. Uh, we started to see um, uh, much more fire activity uh, as well as we started to experience uh, um, spot fires uh, in multiple areas, um, which is a great concern of ours. So um, uh, as Chief Armstrong had mentioned, um, each uh, operational period, we have resource requests to go out uh, and those resource requests were basically unfilled. So um, we have folks that, that are still on the line at this point uh, the morning of the 18th uh, that had been out there uh, from the very beginning, um, uh, the early morning of the 16th. So uh, they're running on uh, 48 plus hours of being on the line. Um, and uh, it, it really started to hit us as a, a safety concern. So uh, we did have to make a, a decision uh, whether to leave folks out there or pull them off the line. And uh, we did have to pull some of our resources off the line so that we could get them some adequate rest and get them some food um, so that we didn't get any of our firefighters hurt. <clears throat> Um, as I said, we started getting multiple spot fires, and as the, uh, the day progressed, um, we talked about this map. So the, the increase in acreage overnight from the 17th to the morning of the 18th, um, the fire had grown uh, approximately 4,700 acres. Um, as you saw in those pictures before with the smoke laying down, uh, it really was a, a difficult indicator of, of trying to get a good accurate spot of how far the fire had actually burned to the south. Um, but with ground resources in place and what uh, aerial aircraft we had, mainly helicopters, um, that we were able to fly on the fire uh, in the uh, perimeter um, due to the smoked out conditions, we were able to ascertain uh, that these were what our approximate perimeters were. Um, on this day, um, as you can see uh, to the very far south, uh, the Warnella fire had little to no growth, uh, but the Waddell fire uh, had some growth, but at that time we had uh, what we um, uh, anticipated to be adequate resources to try to contain that fire. As the day progressed on the 18th, uh, the fire continued to grow in intensity um, and it started to uh, uh, have a greater concern uh, to the point where we had uh, engaged with both of our uh, sheriff's departments in both counties uh, on the evacuation processes and what was uh, gonna need to take place uh, for those to occur. Uh, and those evacuation uh, orders were initiated uh, on the 18th. Um, it started in San Mateo County uh, as that had the uh, most immediate uh, uh, need and that San, San Mateo County Sheriff's Department started those evacuation process. In the meantime, we were working with the uh, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department uh, on our evacuation plan, putting that in order uh, and getting those notifications uh, out to uh, the residents. Um, I just want to kind of uh, back pedal just a, a, a short bit here uh, with this picture. Um, this is a picture of Cloverdale Road um, looking back to the south from the Pescadero area. Uh, and then you can see that we were starting to get increased uh, 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 fire buildup of the fire uh, as the day progressed. This is another photo uh, a little bit later in the day, uh, just about before uh, uh, dusk. Um, you can see that we were starting to get those uh, increased um, uh, fire runs uh, on the perimeter of the fire and in the uh, interior where these three fires uh, are starting to burn together uh, and consume all that fuel and uh, put up that significant column uh, of smoke. Um, and all along this time, uh, evacuation orders uh, were uh, being initiated. <clears throat> Reverse 911s were going out. Um, and this is a little bit later in the evening on uh, the 18th. Um, uh, as I said, evacuation orders had already been initiated in the Boulder Creek area, Upper Bonnie Dune, uh, the North Coast, uh, as well as uh, 
uh, the ridge line of skyline um, because we weren't really sure where this fire was going to pick up and run to. Um, if you're very familiar with that area, it has very um, deep uh, terrain and that fire could have ran in uh, multiple directions. Um, firefighters, uh, like I said, had already been double shifted. Um, we had put them down to, uh, to bed them down for rest for safety purposes. Um, but at this point, we had to make a very, very difficult decision on what was the priority. The priority was life safety. Uh, we had evacuations initiated. Um, so we made the decision to wake all those firefighters out of bed and put them back out on the line. Um, the fire continued to make runs to the south um, uh, this evening. Um, it, it, uh, as you can see on the picture on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left of your screen is uh, a picture looking up from uh, uh, upper 236 uh, above Big Basin. Um, as you can see, significant fire runs were occurring. Um, and then if you look at the picture to the right, uh, that's a picture from Pillow Point Harbor uh, looking back to the south. So you can see how that fire had made a, uh, um, some significant runs uh, during that period of time. Um, so I'm gonna show about a 16 second video for you all. Um, this video may uh, trigger some traumatic events or, or rehashing for some of the folks uh, that may have been uh, in an area where uh, the fire was uh, pretty um, significant. So I just wanna make sure that if you do not wanna view the video, um, if you could please turn off your sound uh, and look away for about 16 seconds as I play this video. This video is of uh, Big Basin State Park headquarters. Um, we had uh, those engine companies that were woken up out of bed were sent up into this area to help evacuate uh, the campground uh, there at Big Basin. Uh, and their escape group actually got cut off. And this is just a short video of the fire conditions that they, uh, um, they encountered. <laughs> So uh, it was uh, it was pretty significant there with the amount of fire that was in the, in around park headquarters as they were trying to uh, protect what structures they could, um, but uh, due to the fire intensity, uh, most of those structures uh, were destroyed. Um, this is another photo of about 2 a.m. and the conditions that were out in the last chance area. Um, as you can see, pretty significant uh, crews out there trying to protect what structures they could. Um, they had actually been pulled um, from uh, the Waddell fire. Uh, to be re-deployed um, over to the last chance area uh, to try to protect as many structures as they uh, possibly could. So uh, as I had said, we had requested on the 18th, the uh, CAL FIRE incident management team. Um, during the day of the 18th, the team was uh, en route. Uh, they got into um, uh, the CZU unit. Um, we had uh, done a debrief with them uh, or what we call an in brief with them. We had uh, basically given them the lay of the land. Uh, we had integrated a lot of their operational staff uh, to go out and uh, get the lay of the land and work with our current operational staff that was out on the ground to become more familiar with what was, uh, what was happening. And um, one of the things that, uh, that took place that uh, significantly um, changed uh, the environment from the day before um, is we had a significant uh, fire event. We had the fire spotting six miles in front of itself. The fire burned more than 43,000 acres in that 24 hour period. Uh, so the team came in and inherited uh, a situation that was um, much different than what we had uh, the morning before when we had actually requested them. Uh, this is a picture uh, from an alert wildfire camera uh, located up in the Bonnie Dune area. Um, it, uh, uh, it's located off Patrick Drive. Um, and just a, a note here as a, a timestamp on this camera, it's uh, uh, August 19th at around 11.22 uh, uh, at night. Um, and those are just some uh, indications of what those fire conditions were when that fire uh, went through that uh, area. It should work here. Um, so as I said, um, uh, we, we talked about that original topogra topographical map that we showed in the I just wanna point out these dark green areas. Those were those initial three fires that uh, uh, caused some significant uh, concerns that actually eventually burned down into this area, burnt together and were progressed down uh, to the south uh, into Santa Cruz County uh, and into the San Lorenzo Valley and the North Coast. Um, 
it uh, was um, uh, a consumption of uh, just over um, 43,000 acres in that 24 hour period. So this is just a, another indication uh, on the 20th um, of, of what conditions we had. Um, fire had progressed, uh, was continued to progress in a southerly direction. Um, and uh, as you can see, had significant buildups, uh, full consumption of fuel uh, in that area and was uh, making significant runs into the Bonny Dune uh, and down into, uh, we're basically running the ridge line uh, above Boulder Creek all the way down into uh, the Ben Loman area. Um, as it made its way south. Um, so by August 20th, um, evacuations were in full swing. Uh, they continued all the way into August 22nd. Um, during that period of time, uh, over 77,000 people uh, uh, had been notified to, in order to evacuate. Um, this was the only option we had at this time due to our uh, consistent lack of resources and not getting orders to fill. Um, we had no resources to really get in and try to do perimeter control or structure protection. It was more so to try to get folks out and uh, take action where we could uh, to make any progress uh, on the fire until we got additional resources in uh, a few days later. So uh, looking at um, the, the 20th, um, that growth between the 19th and 20th, um, we still had a significant fire growth that day. Uh, it was about 15,300 uh, acres. Uh, it's indicated in that lighter green. The fire was still pushing to the south. Um, we did have some increases on the north coast, uh, but the fire was primarily uh, moving and continued to push to the south. Uh, on the 21st, um, as you can see, uh, fire progression um, was still moving. Um, some of this area over here, and this is where it was dropping down into Felton and Ben Lomond, um, uh, where we, uh, we were just starting to get resources uh, in um, uh, to really help us with that um, suppression effort and getting a perimeter control around here. On the 22nd, you can see, see that the growth was really starting to subside at that point. Um, and then uh, this is a, just real quick, a, um, a summary um, of the uh, progression of the fire from the start until the, uh, I believe it's the 26th. So I'm gonna start this, um, this progression here It'll start out with a bunch of red dots. Whoop, sorry about that. Um, it'll start with a bunch of red dots. Those are the lightning strikes that had started fires. Uh, then it'll progress to uh, some uh, underlayment colors that will give you the perimeters of each day. So those are the big progression days, as you can saw, it had that large progression and then it continued to progress out uh, over the next few days. Small progressions as we got more resources in and started to get our perimeters in. Um, so as you can see, the perimeter uh, control had really uh, uh, subsided and uh, we had not full containment, but pretty good containment on it uh, as of the 28th. Um, this is a, another uh, progression I'm gonna show you. This was just a, a progression of the evacuations um, as we, uh, um, those evacuations were conducted and the uh, fire perimeter will um, be underneath that progression for the evacuations. These are strictly evacuations that we're capturing. This is fire kind of building up. And as you start to see those red and orange boxes, those are the evacuation zones that were ordered to evacuate based on the day. So the yellow uh, indicates that those are evacuation warnings and the red is evacuation orders, uh, which were carried out uh, during this process. Pretty quick here, you'll start to see some green show up and that is part of the repopulation where we um, started allowing residents back into their, their homes based on the, the perimeter control and the, uh, the safety that we felt that the fire was not going to progress any farther to the uh, south and to the east. 
It took a while for us to get the evacuation orders lifted. Obviously, there was a significant amount of uh, infrastructure that was damaged uh, during this fire, uh, and that had uh, a lot to do with um, us being able to get uh, folks back in because we needed to make it safe for everybody uh, once they uh, got back into the area. So and as of to date, um, we still only have one zone that is in a mandatory evacuation. Uh, and that is, uh, you can see here, this didn't progress all the way to the end, but uh, is the uh, one zone in Big Basin State Park, which is uh, still closed uh, as the highway is closed. So we still show it remaining closed. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Chief Armstrong. So I uh, just wanted to spend the next couple of minutes or next uh, couple of slides going over uh, a little bit of um, information on our uh, resources that we did have uh, or, or, or lack uh, for this event. And the one thing, um, you know, that's a, a constant thing that we've heard is that we didn't have enough stuff on this fire. And you, what you're hearing from us tonight is that we absolutely agree. Uh, Chief Lark and I agree wholeheartedly. We did not have enough resources of pretty much any type on this fire. And uh, we knew that from the beginning, we were constantly trying to uh, get additional resources in. Um, so what I wanna go over with this slide was just as a handful of things. Uh, uh, what you're looking at is a couple of things, the daily progression of the acreage, the daily progression of the containment, and the total number of personnel actually assigned to the incident. Uh, one thing I like to uh, have people note on the total number of personnel assigned is uh, that's the total number of personnel assigned. Uh, remember that, uh, you know, our, our firefighters typically uh, work uh, 24 hours on, 24 hours off, because they have to have some sort of rest at, at some point. So, so they rest a day and come back out. Uh, for the first couple of days of, of this fire, they, they weren't getting that. They were they were on it uh, the full time. But the other point of that total personnel assigned, there's uh, a percentage of that that's not actually firefighters on the line too. Uh, that's uh, folks that are uh, that are supporting the operations and everything. Uh, those are assigned to the fire, but not on the fire line. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is the containment. Um, Chief Larkin mentioned at the beginning uh, of this, we, we base all incidents, whether it be a, a vehicle accident, a hazmat, a, a, a small fire, a large fire, we have three incident priorities that we go in order. Life safety, property, and environment. And until we uh, take care of protecting the life safety of, our, of ourselves and the citizens, uh, we can't move on to protecting property and resources. Yeah, sometimes we can do that together, but when we have a significant life threat, we have to address that. So uh, for the first couple of days uh, of, of the fire and into the evacuations, when we still had a lot of folks in, in those populated areas, uh, they, they uh, shift our, our mindset a little bit in making sure that they're safe before we can really protect the homes. Um, so, like I said, we, we, were, we were taxed on resources. Um, we had taxed all of our uh, volunteer companies, um, all the local agencies uh, from the Valley agencies of Boulder Creek, Ben Lohman, Felton, were all engaged in structure defense with these. Um, all of our uh, other local cooperators like Santa Cruz City, Scotts Valley, uh, everybody was on this fire, uh, especially the, the, the night that it really blew up on the 18th. I think the, the city departments essentially had like one engine left in Santa Cruz um, um, protecting the entire city and, and so forth. So they were giving us everything they had. It, it just wasn't enough. And the other thing, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it in an earlier slide, but if you, a, a lot of you folks have been here long enough, you're familiar enough with the geography. Uh, remember uh, that that day, the, the resources that we had on, uh, on the fires, they were out on logging roads in the San Mateo uh, uh, forest, uh, essentially. So when this fire got up and ran uh, towards uh, Boulder Creek and, and the rest of the San Lorenzo Valley, those resources weren't on the fire line. They had to drive all the, you know, come off the line, drive down Highway 1 and, and come in. So there was some lag time. So that's when we were really bringing in, uh, we, we were calling in everybody that we had and Chief Larkin might go over that as well when he mentions, uh, when he talks about the mutual aid system, so. Uh, we, had, we had absolutely everything available to us at the time from the local agencies. Um, the mutual aid system uh, in California, uh, we're highly reliant on that mutual aid system. So uh, a lot of folks uh, don't realize 
Cal Fire at its peak of fire season, which we were in at this time, has 356 fire engines. That's it. Um, it, it really doesn't seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things. That's statewide. Uh, not all 356 of those fire engines can go to every single fire. So uh, one thing we've heard a lot is uh, that, you know, it was X number of days before I saw a Cal Fire engine. That's because we're highly reliant in these large fires on that mutual aid system and getting those local government agencies uh, from throughout the state uh, to, to help us out. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lag time, right? Um, for what you guys could hop in your car and drive three hours away, that takes us a day or two for those departments to be able to uh, backfill resources and still protect their community, but, but um, send resources to help us. So uh, while that mutual aid system is great, remember they were taxed too because there's all these fires statewide and everybody's asking for the same stuff. Uh, by the end of this incident, we would have um, crews from the National Guard on it. We had out-of-state resources. Um, we had the, the furthest away was New Jersey. So we had folks from Arizona, Colorado, all over the place. But we had uh, firefighters from New Jersey uh, by the end of this. And it, if you think that's, that doesn't take a little while to get it, it absolutely does. Uh, next slide, please, Chief. Um, so this is just a snapshot. And granted, this is August 23rd. This isn't, uh, you know, the, the day that our fire really blew up on the night of the 18th. Uh, but if you look at the start time on, uh, on or the start date on a lot of those fires, they were right about the same time as ours. And, and we show you this um, to emphasize, this is all the fires throughout the state that we were, what, what we say, in competition for resources. And so there's a uh, statewide system. Oh, there we go. Um, there's a statewide system uh, that's implemented during uh, fire season when there's a lot of fires going on. Uh, and it's uh, cooperators from the state, federal, and local uh, levels that prioritize fires for uh, resources. And there are several factors that go into that from the, the size in acres uh, to the potential size of, you know, um, life uh, structure and infrastructure threats and so forth. And so for the first uh, three days, the 16th, 17th, 18th, um, we were in that pool with everybody else. And, and that's that group uh, has a very regimented way that they uh, rank these fires. And we were number three in the state. So we weren't going to get everything that we asked for, which is, which is uh, clear. Uh, but we were number three in the state. Uh, the day of the 19th, we became number one. So that, that doesn't get us anything. But just to show you that there, there is a process to this. And, we're, we're kind of at the mercy of that process sometimes. Uh, go ahead and advance forward there, Chief. So uh, one thing I, I do like to um, show here is, um, like I said, we, we, we were strapped for resources. We absolutely agree. Uh, but when I started uh, you know, talking to folks at these other fires and, and started realizing our priority, uh, we put this together. And this is uh, just shows uh, our fire, the CZ August Lightning Fire, as well as some na neighboring fires that we were in competition for resources. Um, that fire below us, uh, going down that left-hand column, is the Santa Clara Lightning Complex. Uh, that was to the east of us in Santa Clara County, uh, I believe, in, in into Stanislaus County. Um, the LNU Lightning Complex was the North Bay Area, uh, Sonoma. And you can see, um, I don't have anything for the first three days because they were just handling that fire on their own. Uh, they're a large unit. They have a, a ton of resources available uh, and they were kind of managing that on their own for uh, didn't start reporting out yet. And then the final uh, fire uh, on the bottom there is the river fire that was in Monterey County, um, just to the south of us. So just a couple of things to note, like on the, on the 16th, uh, our fire was sitting at 300 acres. Um, uh, Santa Clara, just to the east of us, oh, I'm sorry, um, the river fire to the south of us, almost seven times the size of our fire, and we had more um, fire engines than they did. Just barely, but, but we did. Uh, moving into the 17th, um, when our fire was sitting at 861 acres, uh, the Santa Clara fire to the east of us was almost four times our size, but we had four times as many fire engines. We had just um, many crews, and we actually got a couple of helicopters that day, uh, whereas they had none. Uh, just skipping ahead past the 18th, um, the, a couple of things to note on the 19th. 
Uh, one, our fire isn't the only one that grew exponentially that day. Yeah, it grew huge, uh, but if you look at that Santa Clara fire, it went from 35,000 acres to 102. Um, and that river fire, that was a little bit smaller, but it went from 4,500 to 15,000. So all these fires grew at an exponential rate uh, that, that night of the 18th and in the morning of the 19th. Uh, but specifically on the, on the 19th, uh, it, again, if you look at our fire at 49,000 acres, that uh, Santa Clara fire was twice the size of ours, and we had three times the number of bulldozers, twice as many fire engines, more hand crews, three times as many helicopters, and so forth. So I could go on, but um, the picture I'm trying to paint here is uh, we absolutely agree. We, we wanted, um, my partner Jonathan puts it well, we, we wanted um, firefighters coming in by the, by the thousands, and we were getting them by the tens or, or, or the hundreds at best, which you saw in that, that previous graph I showed you. So. Uh, un unfortunately, at a at a uh, drawdown like this um, that we experienced, it was it was just so hard to get. Uh, and back to you, Chief. All right, um, thank you, Chief uh, Armstrong. And uh, so, just to just to give a quick recap summary um, uh, of the events that led us up to um, this point. So. Um, we had, uh, during our incident, um, we had put out over 112 informational uh, press releases uh, for the incident. And one of the things that uh, we, uh, once the team got here and we got really established, uh, one of my priorities and one of my objectives for the team was uh, to make sure that information uh, was fresh and available. Um, so we were doing uh, two-day uh, incident briefings, uh, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., uh, we were making sure that all the social uh, media outlets that we utilize, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, uh, Nextdoor, were all uh, fully functional and uh, activated. Uh, one of the uh, uh, most sad parts about this fire is we did have one uh, uh, civilian fatality out in the last chance area. Um, we evacuated over 77,000 people uh, between the two counties, uh, which was a, a monumental uh, task. Uh, and to only have one civilian fatality um, it is a testament to our uh, sheriff's office for being able to get these uh, folks out and get that messaging out to everybody to, to, to leave the area. Uh, the final acreage of the fire was 86,509 acres. Um, 63,000 of that uh, was in Santa Cruz County, uh, and the remaining uh, portion of that was in uh, San Mateo County at 22,755 acres. Uh, there was 1,490 uh, structures destroyed in this fire. Um, 1,431 of those were in Santa Cruz County, and of that, 911 of those in Santa Cruz County were single-family dwellings. Uh, at the peak of our fire, um, we had uh, just over 2,400 firefighters assigned. Um, you know, that peak was very fast uh, before we started to see a decline uh, due to those other fires in the state that started to break out after uh, our fire had started, um, uh, started to draw resources away uh, pretty quickly. Um, based on the priorities and our uh, success at getting containment once we got resources here uh, to accomplish that. Um, this is the largest fire in Santa Cruz uh, recorded history. Um, so uh, that was uh, something very significant um, that uh, none of us ever wanted to see, uh, but it happened. Uh, during this fire, we had uh, uh, infrastructure affected uh, significantly. Uh, we had bridges destroyed, um, uh, power lines, and our uh, telecommunication infrastructure was damaged pretty heavily uh, during this fire. Um, we remained on this incident uh, for months, um, and uh, just in our last uh, few months uh, in January, even with the wind events we had here, uh, we still had some areas out in the remote areas of the fire in the well interior uh, areas where we had fires that had popped up, um, where uh, there's still hot material out there uh, that hasn't uh, fully burnt out yet or um, uh, been fully extinguished in by the rains. So uh, we've been out there trying to uh, uh, contain those areas and make sure that those were out uh, during that uh, period of uh, January when we had those uh, uh, storms that came through. And, uh, you know, we, we burnt uh, 100 acres um, in the month of uh, January, uh, which is unheard of for us uh, here in Santa Cruz County. Um, and then uh, the fire is uh, the cost tag, uh, price tag for it was a little bit over $68 million to fight the fire. And uh, one of the key uh, elements here is that uh, we exhausted all of our local resources. Um, uh, I'm the uh, OES Operational Area Coordinator for Santa Cruz County. And, and during this uh, fire, um, we had engaged all of our local cooperators uh, throughout the uh, county uh, to assist us with this fire and our local uh, uh, fire agencies 
uh, in the neighboring counties of San Mateo, Santa Clara, um, to provide resources to us. Um, it got down to the uh, the point where um, we we were we were calling backdoor bro deals and uh, calling our neighbor to the the east and saying, hey, can you just give us a few engines for the night so uh, we can try to protect structures? And uh, they would say, hey, I can give you a few engines. Uh, they would send them on over, um, and and we would be the good partner, and we would let those engines go back uh, uh, at the end of that uh, requested time frame. But uh, they were very instrumental in helping us with specific task oriented. Um, uh, suppression efforts uh, on this fire. So um, this is uh, uh, just an aerial photo of, uh, of, of the burnt uh, aftermath, uh, looking back from the south towards the north, um, just a devastating fire. It consumed a lot of uh, forested land, a lot of homes uh, that are in the rural environments, um, just a, a devastating fire. Um, you know, the sheer lack of resources uh, Honestly, I think that if we could have gotten a, a lot more engines here a lot sooner, uh, it would have been a much different story. Uh, and as we paint that picture of the lack of resources, uh, which I'm gonna cover here uh, um, in just a minute when I talk a little bit about lessons learned, uh, I was the initial attack I see uh, on the uh, Lockheed fire, um, which was burnt about 8,000 acres in 2009. Uh, and during that fire, um, the next morning when I uh, walked into briefing, uh, we had about 800 uh, fire personnel at our briefing that morning. Uh, as you saw in our presentation, uh, our next morning briefing uh, consisted of uh, about 300 total people on the fire uh, that was spread out in a much more geographical area. But within 72 hours, we had over 1,500 people on the Lockheed fire. Here, it took us uh, almost uh, 12 days to have uh, that number of people on this fire. So that just gives a sure, sure testament of the draw down our resources statewide. So uh, moving on to um, our lessons learned. Um, so uh, when we look back at this fire, one of the key indications uh, that we look back on is our fuel conditions. Um, so our fuel conditions have never presented us with uh, this type of fire conditions um, uh, in, in the history of the 100 years of recorded fire history that we have here uh, in CZU during the CZU Lightning Complex. Um, you know, this is a continued uh, years of drought and climate change. Um, uh, this is requiring us to have to revisit uh, how we look at our fuels. Uh, you know, um, we, we have been noted here on the central coast to kind of be the asbestos forest. Fires just don't burn here uh, because of our uh, mild climate and uh, the high fuel moistures we get due to our, uh, you know, great rain seasons that we have here. But we haven't experienced that in, in many, many years. So it's really having uh, an effect on, on how we are going to look at our fuels uh, moving forward uh, with those conditions and how they're going to carry fire uh, and how we make decisions based on that. Um, the lightning event, uh, as we indicated, we have a lightning coordination plan um, that was uh, was implemented uh, as it was designed. Um, everything uh, worked as it was. Um, we exercised that plan. Um, we had resources out, uh, as we said, some of them in pickups with shovels out trying to contain as many of these uh, these 27 fires that we had. We had engaged our local cooperators. Um, you know, uh, I know we had uh, folks from Boulder Creek uh, and Ziani out on fires for multiple uh, uh, shifts to, to help contain these fires in a small area. Well, these fires that were in the more remote areas, um, uh, we had more difficulty in because we actually had to cut our way into those fires because there is really a limited access to that. Uh, but the, the one thing that uh, our lightning uh, plan, uh, we weren't able to do, we weren't able to execute that plan uh, as it was designed because of the lack of resources. So uh, the design is um, you search out and uh, find these small fires uh, and you you bombard it with resources, put the fires out where they're small uh, and everything's good. But that's the one thing that uh, we're, we're looking back at that and uh, the lack of resources really uh, made a difference there. Uh, evacuations, um, this is another uh, big uh, uh, item that we're looking at and how we um, reference our evacuations uh, based on our fuel conditions. Um, you know, these rates of spreads that we saw in this fuel that we've never seen burn like that in this area of the state uh, is really having to, uh, we're having to look back at that and say, based on what we've seen and what we know, uh, evacuations will uh, need to be considered and conducted much earlier in fire events uh, in the future uh, so that we can get people out of harm's way in the event that we have uh, the lack of resources. But also the consideration is, is these are narrow mountainous roads uh, that we all live in in this area 
uh, and it's difficult to get large number of people out in a very uh, quick period of time. Uh, and that's one of the things that um, uh, we're, we're considering now. Um, and then infrastructure failures. Um, you know, with the damage that was, was caused prior to the, or during the lightning event, there was a lot of um, uh, trees that were blown down and the infrastructure was damaged in, in power lines, as well as telecommunication during that. That had significant impacts on our ability to communicate with the public. Um, you know, the, the infrastructure, um, you know, in the, in the far remote areas of the, the rural communities or even some of the just, just remoter areas of the community, um, all that stuff is ran on battery backups, a lot of it. Uh, and that infrastructure is old and uh, it hasn't probably been maintained probably to the level it should be. Um, but those batteries don't last as long as they do. And those systems start to fail much earlier uh, in this event, uh, as we saw. And then the damage that it uh, sustained just in the fire uh, in itself. Um, that really hampered our ability, uh, like I said, to uh, notify the, the public. So um, we're, we're looking at what things we can do um, to <clears throat> provide that notification much earlier uh, in that process. Um, the uh, Code Red system, which is our county uh, reverse 911 system. Um, one of the things with reverse 911 systems, they're an opt-in system. Um, so in order to uh, be a part of that uh, reverse Code Red 911 system, you have to actually physically go in and register in that system uh, to receive those alerts on your cell phones uh, and things of that nature. So um, that's uh, really troublesome because there wasn't a whole lot of folks in the county that had actually went in and registered. Um, I think uh, the number was about 17,000 countywide that had registered uh, for Code Red uh, prior to the fire. Um, the other thing that we found with Code Red is uh, the evacuations were in progress. Um, uh, the reverse 911 system, which is handled through uh, NETCOM, which is our regional dispatch center in Santa Cruz, uh, they found that the system uh, had a throttle on it. So it would not allow uh, the number of calls to go out um, as what we had anticipated. So they were able to work with the vendor and get that throttle increased to, to expedite those calls and get more calls out uh, more uh, timely uh, during the incident. <clears throat> Gonna talk a little bit about the California mutual aid system. I know Chief Armstrong, I talked about it, but California has a robust um, uh, mutual aid system, fire mutual aid system. Um, and during times like this, we had 12,000 lightning strikes that caused 585 fires. 24 of those fires became major events that basically drew all those available resources in. Uh, and when we talk about the, um, the system in place that uh, prioritizes how resources are allocated, um, this is all part of that mutual aid system and how those uh, are allocated. And as Chief Armstrong indicated, um, we were number third on that allocation, um, but you gotta remember we, were, we weren't number three until almost three days into this lightning event, which a lot of those resources had already been deployed to other fires uh, in the state. Um, we were getting some resources, but they were coming in very, very uh, small increments uh, at that time. Uh, our evacuation platform, um, so the Santa Cruz County, uh, uh, has a uh, evacuation management platform. Uh, this platform was developed um, after the Summit Martin, Trading and Lockheed fires of 2008 and 2009. Um, this version of the platform was used to initiate our evacuations. Um, and, and, but very quickly we found, um, we were in the process of uh, transitioning to a new platform called Zone Haven. Um, we were able to transition seamlessly uh, to the Zone Haven platform um, which uh, brought us a, a few new items that we could do. We actually had uh, visible items that were uh, available to the public um, uh, it, it, almost instantaneously. Uh, when we were evacuating a zone, uh, the zone would be changed and it would allow uh, more of a public facing side of what was actually going on as far as evacuations. Um, and you know, that was used, uh, both those systems were used in the uh, successful and safe evacuation of over 58,000 Santa Cruz County residents and 19,000 San Mateo County residents. Um, fuel reduction efforts. Um, our fuel reduction efforts um, have been very difficult to achieve. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, it's a difficult process in a, in a county like Santa Cruz. Um, though a lot of work has been done, uh, there's a lot more work that has to be done. Um, and this is gonna be, require a, a cooperative effort by all. Uh, the engagement of all of our communities, uh, our resource conservation districts, uh, uh, our fire safe councils, uh, and really starting to leverage, uh, trying to be able to get some funding here to help with that fuel reduction effort uh, through grants and other funding mechanisms. 
uh, our individual property owner um, uh, defensible space in inspections. These are called LE100 inspections. Uh, these are where we come out and make sure you've got your 100 foot or 30 foot of clearance uh, based on our defensible space uh, criteria. Um, those inspections aren't where they need to be. Um, and you know, really we need to have a greater emphasis on gaining compliance with our residents uh, in that program, uh, because really that defensible space is key to us being able to provide any kind of structure protection when we do have resources here to provide that uh, protection. Then our fire prevention messaging, um, you know, that's another key one is uh, uh, we probably don't do enough of this in uh, uh, getting information out to the public uh, on what, uh, what to be prepared for and how to uh, uh, have a plan and your go bag and the, the ready, set, go uh, compliances. Uh, and just overall fire prevention messaging of um, uh, when fire season's coming, how um, to prepare for that and uh, what things to be ready for. So uh, we're looking at methods of trying to increase that messaging uh, to better uh, serve the public under those uh, that format. So um, with that, uh, that uh, concludes our uh, presentation uh, with our lessons learned. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, start our comment uh, question and answer uh, session here. Um, one thing I will say, uh, uh, we do have a time, uh, we're gonna try to get as many questions in as the time we have remaining. Um, but if for some reason we are unable to uh, answer your question, please use the uh, question and answer function within Zoom. Um, we are being provided all the questions uh, that are answered or that are asked so that we can provide answers to them, uh, even though we may not be able to get them uh, all asked and answered in the, in the presentation. Uh, you can also send comments uh, or questions to uh, an email address that we have uh, made available to you. It's called CZU Fire Questions, all one word, CZU Fire Questions at fire.ca.gov. Um, and that uh, we'll be monitoring that uh, to help uh, try to answer some questions. Um, you will receive um, uh, with the email you provided uh, when you uh, registered for the uh, webinar here, um, you will receive a survey uh, that will have a list of questions and some areas where you can add comment uh, to that so that we can get uh, your feedback that way and uh, try to answer questions if we weren't able to do it. And then lastly, um, if you, uh, uh, my name is Ian Larkin, I'm the unit chief. Uh, I've provided you my contact number. Uh, to my office, it's area code 831-335-6700. Um, if you have comments or you would like to talk to me directly about a specific um, uh, question or item, I'd be more than happy to accept your call. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Deputy Chief Jonathan Cox um, to facilitate our question and answer session. Thanks, Chief. Uh, now we'll have some time to answer questions. You'll be able to speak and ask your question in a couple of different ways. Uh, due to the number of questions that we anticipate, we are asking that you limit your question to just one. Uh, we'd like to, you to encourage uh, to use the secondary methods if you have multiple questions, including the survey, as well as the CZU fire questions at fire.ca.gov. We'll answer questions in two ways and we'll alternate in between the two. The first is if you um, uh, use the raise hand function on the phone, uh, or the Zoom, we will be able to monitor the hands that are raised and call upon you. Um, you'll be unmuted and you'll be able to ask your question. If you dialed in using a phone, you can hit star nine um, and then star six to unmute and mute. The secondary way to ask questions is through the Q&A chat function. Um, if you vote for the question, if someone has the question that you'd like answered, you can vote for it and upvote the uh, questions, which we will see at the top and get to. Uh, we'll be alternating between the two methods uh, to hear as many questions as possible. Again, if we're unable to get to your question, please be sure to use the Q&A function um, and we will capture those questions and answer them at a later time. Uh, you can also uh, get your question answered by emailing ccufirequestions at fire.ca.gov. All right, this is your opportunity to ask questions and get answers. Uh, we just ask again for professionalism and courtesy with your specific questions and note that uh, disruptions will not be tolerated. Uh, with that, we will start by answering uh, questions uh, through the raised hand function. Um, and we will start with Jacqueline Hendricks. Hi, um, thank you for holding this forum tonight. Really appreciate it. 
Um, so my question is that on your YouTube channel, um, uh, you uh, feature a video of the Loma Mar volunteers on scene on uh, August 16th at 11.51 at Butano Ridge in San Mateo County. Um, yet in your presentation tonight, you were saying that the fires in that area and those three regions were inaccessible. And how do you kind of uh, justify the difference here in what you're reporting both on your YouTube and in your um, report tonight? Thank you. Question, thanks Jacqueline. And I'll pass that to Chief Larkin. Yeah, Jacqueline, thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, most of the fires that were in that general area of uh, San Mateo County uh, they weren't fully inaccessible. There was uh, a couple of them that had burned down to a couple access roads uh, up on the Butte No. But two of the primary fires had very, very difficult access that we were actually having to cut our way in uh, to those fires. Uh, and some of those fires, I'm not sure exactly when the picture uh, had been taken, but uh, the fires had burned down to a couple of the road systems uh, a day into the fire, uh, but the vast majority of them had uh, uh, to be cut into. So. Um, not necessarily saying they're fully inaccessible, but we did have very difficult access uh, into numerous uh, fires in that area. All right, next question we'll take is from Forrest. Um, uh, what I'm hearing is um, that there's there, there seems to be a big discrepancy between um, what CAL FIRE is reporting as fact and what people on the ground experienced as fact. And I'm wondering when uh, there will be an actual public meeting or debrief with the public where we can actually hammer out what really did and did not happen and at what time those events occurred. Yeah, Forrest, thanks for your question. So uh, what I can say to that is uh, the information that we're providing is the information that we have. Um, we're not fabricating, we're not, uh, the information you may be getting may be coming from different sources that had different experiences. So uh, these are coming from our folks that were on the line uh, and information that we have uh, at our disposal to uh, provide uh, the information we have in this presentation. Uh, thanks for the question. And there are no additional meetings planned at this time. All right, next we will go to Bree Driver. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, could you please address the local firefighter response and how Cal Fire worked with those resources? Did you work with the Boulder Creek, Ben Loman and Felton Fire Departments? These were readily available resources that were familiar with the area. And also, will working with local fire departments be a part of future plans? And how will they be involved in the future processes with CAL FIRE? Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Yeah, yeah, Bree, uh, thank you for the question. Um, and we do work very closely with our local cooperating fire agencies, uh, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Boulder Creek, Ben Loman, and, and Felton Fire Districts. Uh, and during this uh, uh, incident, uh, the, all three agencies were brought into unified command. Uh, at some point in the early stages uh, when we were out um, uh, suppressing the smaller uh, lightning strike fires, um, all those agencies were uh, actively involved in the, the assistance in suppressing those fires. So um, we have a, a great relationship with those uh, folks uh, and all those agencies. And uh, as I said, they were all part of the unified command structure uh, uh, when the incident escalated. So uh, they had a, an active role in the uh, suppression efforts uh, for the fire. Chief Armstrong, did you want to add anything to that or were you just turning? All right, uh, we'll take one more uh, hand raised question and uh, let's go to MC Dwyer for the next one. Hi, I just want to say I really appreciate getting information from your perspective. It does help understand what happened that this fire did literally explode overnight. Um, just a couple of points. Um, the evacuation strategy through Code Red, um, we received an evacuation notice that said there was a fire in Loma Mar. And when I looked at that on the map, that was like so far away. I mean, we took it seriously. We got out. And I'm really grateful that, you know, there was only one person that died. So, you know, obviously your evacuation worked, but. Um, I'm just letting you know it, it was not very specific. It said it was an evacuation 
we didn't understand the difference between an advisory and a mandatory. So that's just a note. Um, I do want to address something I saw in the Q&A several times. There are a lot of rumors that the local firefighters were overruled by Cal Fire and were not allowed to defend neighborhoods. Do you, can you speak to that? Um, if, if that occurred, I'm unaware of it. Um, so uh, to answer that question is we were actively engaged. I know the local fire agencies um, had committed resources to the incident through the uh, Unified Incident Command Structure. And they had also taken action uh, in their own communities with additional resources uh, to pr protect assets within their fire districts, which uh, is to, to their um, uh, to their uh, legal uh, right to do. So um, uh, that's about all I can speak to that uh, is uh, they were actively engaged um, and, uh, and I'm unaware of them ever being told uh, that they could not participate. So um, what I can say on the evacuation uh, messaging um, in the early phases of this, um, I know some of the messaging may have been confusing um, as it uh, indicated the fire in Loma Mar uh, would have been the fire that actually had made its way uh, and burned down into Santa Cruz. Those three fires um, uh, had emerged and burnt down into Santa Cruz County. So um, we are trying to tighten up that messaging um, uh, in, in that process. Um, so I know some of the messaging that went out early on uh, may have been confusing. And I know that's one of the other um, items that we are looking at in our evacuation management um, uh, platform is to provide better education for the public. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we are transitioning to this new platform called Zone Haven. Uh, and in that process, um, we, we will be rolling out a Know Your Zone campaign. So to, to educate folks, uh, the public, on more uh, what which each of those uh, type of indications mean, whether it's a warning or if it's an order. Uh, and, and currently we have an advisory status in place for any of those areas that might have a, a debris flow uh, consideration. So um, that, that's part of our, our, our goal here in our fire prevention messaging uh, is to roll that out with our Know the Zone campaign, uh, along with our co uh, local cooperating fire agencies that are part of the uh, Zone Haven product uh, that will be uh, rolled out here in the very near future. Thank you for the question. All right, next question we'll take from the, the Q&A in the chat, and that is from Linda Garfield. If you have the technology to measure moisture content in forest fuels reliably, reliably and are fully aware that we're in a multi-year drought amidst scientifically proven climate change, please explain why CAL FIRE was caught off guard by how quickly this fire blew up, particularly when the current weather was as you explained. And uh, I'll, I'll be happy to field it, uh, Chief Cox. So Linda, thank you for the question. Um, and I think we kind of may, may have answered it in bits and pieces, but I'd like to tie it together a little bit. Um, we use all the tools available to us. Uh, and one of the most uh, reliable things for us is, there are a couple of most reliable things for us, historical data and real-time data. So for the first uh, couple days of, of this fire, like we mentioned, was really burning very, uh, very slow and everything. Um, uh, not real intense fire by any means. And so we had that real time data that we're looking at. Uh, historically, uh, like we said, uh, the fires just haven't seen, and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a perception that everybody has that, uh, uh, or used to have anyway, that uh, redwood forests were, were fairly resilient and didn't burn with the intensity that we saw here. Um, we, uh, Chief Larkin mentioned that, uh, you know, this fire burned 43,000 acres in less than 24 hours. Af after this uh, fire was over, I asked our, uh, our uh, fire captain that uh, tracks the stats and everything and data and the footprints of all these fires, hey, how, how many years do we have to go back um, to, uh, to have burned 43,000 acres? And he says, it's really easy, I already checked, never. He said, we have 100 years of recordable fire history in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, and we haven't collectively ever burned 43,000 acres. So um, to answer your question, yeah, it, we were caught off guard uh, to that extent because this fire did something that we had never ever seen before and nobody had in this area. And Chief, All right. you add to that? Uh, yeah, you know, I was just gonna add <clears throat> that uh, not necessarily being caught off guard, um, if we would have had adequate resources earlier in the uh, fire, 
we would have been able to get in and suppress these fires before they were able to grow in size and intensity. Um, what, what did catch us off guard is how rapidly they were able to expand. We had never seen uh, our, our redwood forest um, uh, burn like they did. Uh, and it was, uh, it was alarming to us when we saw that. And, and that's in our lessons learned, we conveyed that, that we are really having to look uh, into the future based on this uh, drought and climate change that we're seeing, uh, 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 how we react and how we plan and prepare um, for um, uh, that type of um, event to occur if it ever occurs again. Uh, and you got, and I think the, the key element here is to remember that um, it's not every day that we get uh, 12,000 lightning strikes that hit California uh, and our resources get drawn down due to the you know, 585 fires and 24 major events. So. Um, it's not every day that we're going to see that. Um, you know, we, we go back to the uh, Lockheed fire where we had, you know, 1,500 people within 72 hours uh, here to fight that fire and kept it small and we were able to contain it. And what I will revert back to in that, that eight-year period uh, or in 2008, um, or actually 2009 was the Lockheed, um, is one of the areas that we uh, were able to contain the fire was at a redwood forest. Um, and, and the fire significantly slowed down when it hit that fuel type. So. Uh, those, those are the things that we're taking into consideration as we uh, look into the future. All right. Next question, and this one kind of gets back to um, a little bit of the volunteers locally, is from Jamie um, Serralo. How did Cal Fire protect uh, his station in Jamison Creek, but not the water company next to it, um, or the entire neighborhood next to and around the station? And then can you address the rumors of CAL FIRE telling um, BCFD to back down from the Fallen Leaf neighborhood? Um, yeah, so uh, in relation to the uh, Jamison Creek station, so uh, um, what I can say is uh, in that area, that station has a great uh, defensible space around it. Uh, there is not uh, much vegetation in and around the building. It's got adequate uh, clearances around there. So uh, why that station is still standing, um, uh, I know we had a resource in and around that area at the time, um, but I, I really don't have a good answer to that question other than, um, you know, it had good defensible space. Uh, uh, it is constructed uh, with a metal roof, um, you know, so that may have had, played a, a factor into that. Um, and I'm trying to see, reread this question here. Uh, as far as the um, uh, question of uh, having the Bol uh, Boulder Creek volunteers back down from Fall and Leaf, once again, I, I don't have any direct information uh, and can't confirm um, if that actually occurred. I, I do not know, so I cannot answer that question, but uh, I will uh, try and get back to that and I'll, I'll note who asked that and uh, see if we can get a response. All right, uh, next question, we'll go to Beth Dyer. It's a, a four part question. So we'll start with number one. We understand the resources from the state for firefighting this fire was limited. Uh, what was the backup plan when resource requests went unfilled, particularly early in the fire? At the time, what was Cal Fire's policy on using local resources? And has that policy changed or might be changed going forward? Okay. Okay. That's, a, that's a lot to field. Do you want to field some of that, uh, Nate? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll cover some of that. And thank you, Beth, uh, for, for the, the few questions. I, I might be able to cover all these, and if not, Chief will. will help me out here. Um, so at the time, uh, what was CAL FIRE's use? Uh, uh, we absolutely use our local resources. So uh, I know at least as of the morning of the 18th, uh, we had two uh, local government uh, strike teams, uh, which is a group of five engines and a, and a, and a leader um, out of our local government here. And that consisted of you know the city of Santa Cruz, uh, Scotts Valley, uh, Central Fire Protection District, and other cooperators. So we did have those, I believe one of the strike team was a task force, but that's semantics. Uh, so we absolutely had a uh, full engagement of, of the local resources as, as much as they were able to offer up. Uh, the As far as how were local fire departments integrated in the firefighting efforts, uh, I, I think that kind of stands. We got a little bit more, uh, like I said, they everybody offered up what they could in those initial days. And that was even before uh, the, the main body of fire was into Santa Cruz County. Uh, that night of the 18th, when the fire uh, blew into Santa Cruz County, our local cooperators were absolutely tremendous. They threw absolutely everything they had at it. Like I said earlier, uh, 
each of the, the, the major cities that have, have three to four fire engines in them at a time dumped everything into uh, to, to this effort because uh, they knew uh, that we needed it. And then when were they integrated into Unified Command? I'm gonna skip past that and I'm gonna let Chief Field because he might remember the, the exact date. Uh, but they were integrated immediately as far as uh, when the fire did come into the community, as far as helping uh, um, indicate the zones uh, the, of their communities that needed to be evacuated uh, in that effort. Uh, as far as what is CAL FIRE's policy regarding the use of trained volunteers, it's somewhat vague to me. Um, but what I can say uh, is uh, CAL FIRE administers the uh, Santa Cruz County uh, fire department, and we do have uh, five uh, volunteer companies uh, throughout the county, and they are um, they are trained to a high level, uh, and we have to make sure that anybody uh, that will be participating in firefighting is qualified and trained at that level. Um, I, I know the question has come up of it, what seems to be kind of like the old days, uh, almost what the forestry fire departments uh, were founded on, where you know the boss would go down to the the logging and mining camps and and grab any willing body, and unfortunately we just can't do that anymore, uh, due to uh, you know liability and safety uh, of yourselves and and those folks. Uh, and as far as um, local cert teams involved by Cal Fire and disaster response efforts, including the evacuations and firefighting. Uh, none of our local uh, uh, CERT uh, volunteers are trained to uh, any sort of firefighting level. Uh, um, and uh, as far as evacuations go, we do have uh, um, Chief Deputy Chris Clark uh, on, the, uh, on the line tonight. Uh, the evacuation effort is truly a law enforcement function. So Chief Deputy uh, Clark might be able to answer that a little bit better. But one thing I can tell you is uh, while they, uh, might be trained to help with evacuations and everything, uh, we uh, probably would not be comfortable putting them in an active fire uh, situation, being that they do not have the training, protective equipment and so forth. And uh, Chief Deputy Clark, I don't know if you wanna add on that at all. No, thanks uh, Chief Armstrong. We had uh, uh, nearly 200 personnel that, that, next, that very next night. We had everybody we could the night of and then a ton, tons of personnel the following night and uh, in the fall and the nights that follow. So I felt good about our staffing numbers um, uh, from our evacuation standpoint. So hopefully that answered the question. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Chief Deputy Clark. I just had one, uh, one item to answer to that. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, the use of local resources, um, we had agencies uh, as Chief uh, Armstrong stated, uh, that committed um, heavy, heavy commitments, upwards of 75% of their uh, department uh, to helping fight the fire. Um, uh, and, you know, we, ha we had folks that were coming back, uh, asking to, to come back from vacation, uh, refusing to leave the line. Um, so uh, the all out effort uh, of everybody involved, uh, all the agencies here locally in Santa Cruz County, uh, it was a monumental effort from, uh, if they were only protecting their own district to the folks that were uh, on the far edges of the, uh, the lines out in the remote areas. Uh, everybody was putting in 100% effort um, to try to, uh, to get these fires under control so uh, that we would uh, be able to bring some kind of safety back to the community. All right, our next question is from Brian B. Were homes slash neighborhoods systematically triaged? You've made clear that you were understaffed, but how did you deal with this fact and optimize the resources you did have. There are numerous reports of engines standing idle. Lastly, can you please give some specific, some further specifics on spotting? What was the criteria to prioritize these spot fires? All these answers will go to better, to bettering future responses. So uh, let me let me try to break this uh, question out. So uh, were, were neighborhoods systematically triaged? Um, so what I can say is uh, later in the event, when we did get folks uh, in, uh, they were able to actually go in and do some structure triage and uh, actually put, uh, you, some may have seen these little yellow tags uh, with triangles on them uh, where folks had went in and uh, actually triaged uh, structures. Um, so what I can say, um, when we had resources available to do that, um, they were absolutely out doing that, but that was later in the event. Um, as I said, our three priorities are life safety, property and environment. 
uh, in the early stage of this, when this fire rolled down out of the out of the uh, un, unpopulated areas into the more populated areas of our rural communities, um, our main focus was getting people out of the way and protecting lives. Um, so um, that 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 was our main focus. Um, and then uh, let me see if I can dig uh, what else uh, we have here. Uh, it's a multiple part question. Uh, which I see the, the fire the next um, part per person. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the uh, spot fires. So um, yeah, so this fire, uh, once the fire got up into the crowns, uh, there was ember cast that was carrying embers uh, well in advance of the main fire that was actually starting um, smaller spot fires out in front of it uh, that would grow uh, in size. And then when the main fire would consume those spot fires and those spot fires were uh, preheating uh, uh, the fuel in front of the main fire, uh, which allowed that fire to grow uh, even much faster. So. Um, uh, the, the, I'm not sure what the, your, the prioritization of a spot fire is, but when you have no resources to send anywhere um, uh, to handle additional spot fire somewhere, um, it, the spot fire uh, is just becomes part of the main fire. There is no way to prioritize those until we got additional resources in and could actually start uh, perimeter control, which is our obvious uh, primary objective uh, when we do finally get resources in, as well as protecting structure. So. Um, if you can control the perimeter, you can make the fire go out. So uh, that, that those are our, uh, you know, some of our uh, tactical objectives when we start talking about, um, you know, allocating resources. But uh, prioritizing the spot fires, um, you know, that that kind of came with the resources that we had and where we could focus people uh, in, into that. Um, uh, how do we how do we better uh, uh, our our future and responses? Uh, and to answer that is, uh, you know, I, what I can say is. History in this county for all the fires we've had with the exception of this one fire, um, we have been able to uh, uh, maintain a, a, a small amount of structure loss. Um, uh, we did have the one fat uh, civilian fatality on this fire, um, but it's because we had adequate resources. We had uh, able to throw a lot of uh, uh, people and equipment at it to, to suppress these fires and keep them small. Uh, in the situations that we were faced with, with the sheer lack of resources, uh, even our aerial assets, um, you know, our helicopters, the first day, um, the ridge winds were so high, our pilots could not lift off and fly. Um, they attempted numerous times at our request, uh, and it was just too windy for our helicopters to fly um, uh, during those first, uh, uh, you know, first day of the fire, the 16th. And until the morning of the 17th, when the winds subsided, we were able to finally get helicopters up in the air. But the fire was laying down on itself, um, so it, it did uh, hamper our ability to use aircraft uh, for several days. We, where we could effectively use it, we implemented. Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, next question um, comes to us about uh, fuel and contractors. Diane Mischi. Uh, please explain CAL FIRE's operational procedures and decisions to require outside flight contractors to sign contracts regarding aviation fuel that they would not be reimbursed, though they are available to make water drops. These outside contractors were offering to assist, but they were not allowed to due to the requirements of the contracts, though the resources were limited and the state was in duress. Yeah, that, that's a that's a difficult question. I, I'm a little lost on uh, the difference of the flight contractors versus the fuel contractors. So uh, what I can say is our uh, our aviation assets. Um, we have specific uh, purchasing guidelines uh, that are in place with contractors uh, that are certified to provide aviation fuel and uh, uh, aviation fuel that we would need um, for suppression of the fire or to support that suppression of the fire um, would already be allocated for all of our resources that we would have, especially our rotary wing. Uh, which are our, our helicopters. All of our uh, aviation assets, uh, uh, air tankers and things, those refuel at an air base. So that fuel would be there. But uh, to answer your question, uh, those are contractual things that the state uh, on a uh, emergency basis can enter into. But I'm unaware of somebody that actually came to the incident base or anywhere where we would have had interaction with them uh, to even make that request. So, um, uh, you know, it, it comes down to the contracting and what we can hire under that emergency basis. Uh, but aviation fuel, um, like I said, those assets, all of our helicopters are hired what we call wet. Um, they have to provide their own fuel uh, with the exception of our agency specific ships. All right, and we'll take one more um, Q&A typed question before we go back to the raised hand feature. Uh, this comes from Betsy. 
Uh, and it's kind of a fire slash law question. So many residents who know the terrain in the areas and ways into the forests were so willing to be of assistance. Why were locals not utilized? Second part to that is why were locals arrested when they were the ones in there cutting fire breaks in BC? And um, Chief, I'll be happy to feel a little bit of that if you don't mind um, before turning it over or, or, or you can, but um, th thank you for the question, Betsy. Uh, one thing I can say, we were absolutely using uh, locals with their local knowledge uh, the, that are trained firefighters and that were there equipped and part of the system and, and able to be utilized. Uh, we absolutely 100% used that local knowledge. I, I, I was there myself uh, utilizing the help of the of the folks from Boulder Creek Fire Department. Uh, as far as allowing uh, local residents into a, a, an active fire area and not having them properly trained, uh, equipped, et cetera, not uh, held um, uh, accountable to, to any sort of system. We just can't have it because it, it, it affects their own safety as well as the overall operation. Like, like we mentioned before, if we're worried about the safety of somebody else, it's really hard for us to do the rest of the job of protecting the homes and everything. So we, we were absolutely using all information that was available to us uh, through them. As far as uh, locals being arrested, I am myself not familiar with any situation of that sort, but uh, unfortunately I'll, I'll kick that to uh, Chief Deputy Chris Clark. Yeah, thanks Chief Armstrong. Uh, no, uh, that's the short answer. Uh, we did arrest a number of people obviously for, 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 for victimizing people in the fire area. As we said uh, during the event that people were trickling in, uh, looking to uh, you know, do people further harm and, and those people we were looking for and we found them. Um, and so we did arrest a number of people for looting charges, weapons charges, but no, um, we didn't arrest anybody for defending their property. All right, we'll take a raised hand question from Joe Cucciara. Thank you. Uh, with the admitted lack of resources, why were so many resources allocated to cutting the line to protect the university, which was already vacated because of COVID and it's a state facility and the state has far greater resources to rebuild than the individual homeowner or small businesses throughout the San Lorenzo Valley? Uh, yeah, uh, Joe, thank you for that question. So uh, that, that contingency line that was put in uh, down near the university, um, that was put in with bulldozers. Uh, so um, uh, the number of resources that were utilized uh, uh, for that um, specific task um, were, um, I believe it was a total of three bulldozers that were used, uh, and they were only there for a period of, I believe, uh, one complete shift. So it took them 24 hours to push that line in. And that line was pushed in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on the 18th, um, that contingency line was put in around that area. And that was mainly to protect the fire as it was moving to the south uh, to try to have a, a preemptive line in place uh, where we had a fuel type that we could actually get in and actually stop the progression of the fire. Uh, the area that that fuel break was put in was in grass. Uh, much easier to fight fire in grass uh, and that uh, and that line would have uh, potentially held that uh, in check uh, so we could get resources in there to actually stop the, the, the front of the fire from progressing any farther uh, into the city of Santa Cruz or uh, down to the university. Uh, thank you for the question. All right, our next question will come from Mary Jo Walsh. Yes, thank you. Um, so I hear a lot of talk about the community members who wanted to help not being properly trained and the bureaucratic reasons why someone who was not properly trained would not be allowed back in on the fire line. And I'm wondering both what is the hindsight on our lack of community resilience and our number of volunteers who were equipped to handle it? And what is the plan going forward to eliminate the bureaucratic um, hurdles that are holding us back from increasing the number of people who are resilient members of our local fire community resilience. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mary Jo. 
Yeah, Mary Jo, uh, thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so um, you know, that, that's a difficult question to ask uh, uh, and a difficult one to answer on top of that. So, um, you know, it really comes down to uh, uh, having people that are trained for an event. Um, you know, we had a lot of folks that, uh, that did stay behind uh, and they were able to save structures and uh, they were able to um, do, do some uh, good work, I would say. Uh, but uh, some of that good work comes at a cost. Um, you know, in the midst of the fire, um, we had a secondary uh, weather event that was predicted. Uh, they had predicted thunderstorms to roll through the area. Um, we had a uh, hum humongous uh, massive fire increase of 43. Uh, by that time, it was almost 48,000 acres uh, that had ran through areas um, where it had dirty burn. Um, it did not burn and consume the, full, uh, the fuel completely. So um, it ran by so fast that it still had fire to burn. And with all the spot fires that we had, if we would have had that weather system come in and we had all these volunteers out there, um, uh, which we did, uh, and we started getting downbursts that started to blow this fire out even more, um, we were putting all those people, people in harm's way. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, or I'm sorry, fortunately, um, the fact is, is that weather system did not materialize. And for, fortunately for us, um, it, it moved on and didn't cause any significant harm and nobody got hurt. But if that would have came through, the unfortunate event would have been, we probably would have had greater civilian fatalities based on that specific premise of that uh, weather event that could have came in. So as we look into the future, um, uh, you know, that, that's a difficult question that we need to, we need to talk about and, and, and find out what is available to us. But uh, we have to put, uh, as an agency, we have to put trained personnel out there that meet uh, certain requirements. If we don't, uh, we open ourselves up for tremendous liability and lawsuits. Uh, and, and, and we are the bureaucratic uh, government, right? Uh, but we have to set uh, balances and, and, and check uh, measures in place for us um, to keep us uh, in line and to make sure that our personnel and the people that we have out on those lines are trained. Uh, I'll use the example of a contractor. Um, they, uh, we at times as an agency hire contract crews, hand crews to come in uh, which I believe on this fire, we actually had a few uh, that uh, may have been here uh, assisting with cutting fire line. All those crews have to meet a minimum uh, standard of training in order to be hired and uh, be put out on the line. So um, you know, that's, a, that's a difficult question as we move and we look and we, you know, we, we, we talk about resiliency and what that looks like. Um, like I said before, if we had the resources we had available to us to suppress these fires, uh, we would not uh, be having this conversation, right? Uh, but we are having the conversation. And can it happen again? There is potential. Uh, you know, as we look into the future right now of what our fuel moistures look like present day um, uh, due to the lack of rain, um, I'm nervous about it uh, as we move in. If we don't get more rain um, uh, before the beginning of fire season, um, we have serious concerns uh, in Santa Cruz and San Mateo counties with what our fire season potentially could look like uh, as we move forward. So um, those are those are concerns that we all have. But the, the concern we have uh, in greater detail is, uh, uh, you know, life is our number one uh, priority in, in preserving that. And putting somebody in harm's way uh, is just not something that I'm willing to do. All right, next question is from Martin B. Martin, you'll need to unmute yourself to ask your question. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Hey, I wanted to thank you guys for um, holding this meeting, and I really appreciate everything that Cal Fire did. Um, I, do, I do have some questions that are kind of on a macro level, and it has to do with overall California budget. Um, as I'm learning about fires and fires in California, and how the insurance industry, it seems like after the Paradise Fire, they realized that there were some problems and they had to change some rules. Um, we had the car fire in Redding, the fire in Santa Rosa, fires in Southern California. So lots of fires. And we heard um, our senator say on a debate stage in March how our state is on fire. And that was before our fire in Santa Cruz. And so uh, part of my, I guess, part of my problem or part of my question would be, um, I noticed that our governor 
um, just recently had his budget come across for the coming up fiscal year. And he had five bullet points. And the last bullet point was to add $1 billion towards Cal Fire. And so do you think that that is enough money to help the state or is that still underfunded? And I know that that's a big question and I'm having difficulty saying it, but that's really it's sort of a macro question, not a specific to our fire. Great, thank you, Martin. Yeah, Martin, uh, thank, thank you for the question. And, and, I'll, and I'll try to summarize that because uh, it is a very uh, 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 difficult dive into uh, how the state uh, does their funding. Uh, but the governor does have a billion dollars in his budget uh, that was added to that. And um, a, a lot of that money is going to resiliency. It's going to fuel reduction uh, and, and, and that resiliency program. So uh, that not all that funding is gonna go to Cal Fire to increase staffing. Um, we are um, basically receiving some money uh, this year to offset the uh, cost um, uh, for having to implement uh, firefighting and can crews. Um, so uh, due to COVID and the release of inmates uh, at the rate that uh, has occurred in the state um, uh, from prisons, our inmate population that we use for our inmate crews uh, has drastically dropped to uh, very, very low levels. Um, I'll give you an example. Our inmate camp at Ben Loman Camp uh, up in uh, Bonny Dune um, is a five person or a five man camp. So we have five crews there. Um, uh, right now we have two crews staffed because of the lack of inmates. Um, so a lot of that money is going to replace some of those uh, deficits that we have uh, in uh, capacity for the department uh, to be able to provide emergency response. Uh, so uh, some of that money goes to that um, to offset those costs, but a lot of that money is gonna be grant money that's available for resiliency programs uh, for the communities to go after uh, uh, and you know, uh, application process to, to secure funding for us to do fuel reduction and some other resiliency programs uh, in our communities. Thank you for the question. All right, next question. Uh, it's on the Q&A chat and it's an evacuation based question. It's from Antonia Bradford. My great concern is that there is such a lack of trust now in Cal Fire that next time your evacuation compliance that will be incredibly low. How do you plan to work with the public to establish trust and partnership? Yeah, uh, great uh, question, Antonia. Um, you know, that, that is a, a, a concern, right? Um, uh, and I'm not sure um, how the trust level has been dropped. Uh, uh, our sheer uh, reliance on resources is uh, the main factor why this fire grew to the level it did. But um, what I can say about um, uh, the compliance of evacuations is um, I, I understand people are going to want to try to uh, stay behind and defend their properties um, because we had a, a lack of resources. Uh, but what I can say to that is um, uh, if, if we get more uh, emphasis on fuel reduction, defensible space, uh, and people's homes are prepared, um, you know, they, they will feel more comfortable to leave those areas. Um, what I can say as we move forward um, is uh, um, when we ask people to evacuate, we're doing it for one reason. And as I said at the very beginning of uh, my presentation, um, our priorities are life, property, and the environment. Uh, your life is our number one priority. So when we're evacuating you, uh, we're evacuating people for a reason. It's to get you out of harm's way um, so that uh, an approaching fire does not um, cause your death. Um, so uh, I would only hope that uh, folks would realize that and really not make it a trust level with Cal Fire uh, because all we're doing is making the decisions to uh, work with our uh, Sheriff's Department, uh, implement a plan, and then ask them to go affect those uh, evacuations uh, in the future. What I can say is we are going to be evacuating and implementing evacuation plans much earlier in a fire process, just due to our fuel um, situation that we have. Our fuels are much more volatile as, as we described due to uh, continued drought uh, and our uh, continued climate change. Um, and just the sheer lack of rain this year, you know, like I said, I am, I am concerned um, for what our fire season looks like moving forward. All right, a uh, question that has come up a few times in the chat, um, and it is in regard to uh, rumors of backburns. Uh, Chief, I don't know if you wanna hit on just any comments about firing. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, as I stated, this question came up last night as well. So uh, my comment to the uh, uh, any of the backfires, um, you know, we use fire uh, in two ways, offensively and defensively. Uh, it is a fact that it is a tool that we use 
um, to help um, control fires. Um, there are uh, several claims of uh, different backfires that have occurred um, uh, amongst the fire. Uh, and we have uh, a couple complaints that we are looking into. So uh, I'm really not at liberty at this point to discuss any of that uh, ongoing uh, inquiry uh, as it may hamper our abilities to, uh, to get the truth. So uh, we're, we're looking into that and trying to find out what the, that looks like. So um, what I can say is backfires do occur. Um, backfires were most likely lit on this, um, this event uh, in both an offensive and defensive fashion. Um, and we're trying to narrow down uh, which ones uh, uh, may have been done um, in a manner that uh, uh, you know there could be some um, liability there, which uh, at this time, uh, we don't know if that's a, a, an actual factual um, thing that we're still looking into, so thank you. All right, uh, next question is um, um, uh, from Diane Messi. Um, and it is asking, at what point did you meet with the SLV area fire departments telling them they would have no support available from CAL FIRE? I'm not really sure of the question. Uh, when did we meet with the SLV departments and tell them we're not gonna have any support from CAL FIRE? So, um, you know, all the uh, fire departments uh, in the county um, uh, knew that CAL FIRE was in its drawdown um, so um, if additional resources were needed, um, we were not able to provide them from CAL FIRE. And in fact, we were so far uh, drawn down that um, we received a notice from our uh, region administration um, that handles the allocation of resources that um, uh, we were to uncover every one of our fire stations, uh, and which we did. So um, we had no more resources to commit to anything uh, that would be new or any new needs until we got resources through the resource allocation process, uh, which we explained uh, uh, that occurred earlier. We had, um, as we said, we had over 150 outstanding orders for fire engines, um, and numerous orders for crews, aircraft, every piece of equipment um, that you could think of, we had on order trying to get it here uh, to help us um, uh, protect the communities and, and put this fire out. All right, uh, back to the raised hand feature, and we will go to Rebecca Hagan. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to the sheriff. Uh, before I answer my question, um, it was horrible to be displaced um, and evacuated and to see on the news how many people were actually going to go up there to loot. Um, so I really appreciate your efforts in that. And then again to Cal Fire. Um, my question is, I'm off of Clear Creek Road, and um, my understanding is that the fire hydrant was shut off because the major pipe melted. Um, and I wanted to know, I know it's not your area, but I figured you might have some feedback on what they were doing to correct that for the future. Um, yeah, so I, I, can, I can try to answer a portion of that question is, uh, yeah, so uh, there was a, a major pipe that uh, uh, we had several, uh, pieces of infrastructure uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley and other areas of the county um, that were affected by this. Um, uh, due to the uh, uh, pipes melting, because they are a plastic pipe, uh, whether they uh, uh, are buried in the ground or um, if there was other reasons why that they were damaged. But uh, I believe um, uh, most of the water pipes have been replaced. There may be still a few that are uh, outstanding that are due for repair, uh, but I would have to defer you to the water districts uh, specifically uh, to get answers on the, the status of that repair. But um, we did have uh, uh, numerous lines uh, that were damaged in the fire, uh, including areas even out on the North Coast in Davenport, the main feeder line from Santa Cruz to Davenport uh, was burnt in the Mornella fire, which took uh, months to get actually uh, repaired. So uh, I would have to defer you to the water district for that specific answer um, on uh, the repair uh, and what that looks like uh, moving into the future. Thank you for the question. All right, next question will be from uh, D. Scruggs. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Dave. Um, the question I had uh, was about Code Red. Uh, I was actually in the office at Boulder Creek Fire um, during a lot of this. And uh, we were getting people calling the office um, really early into the fire saying that they had code red alerts that they were getting that nobody else in their neighborhood was getting and they were wondering why they were getting these alerts when the fire was still 
you know, 10 to 14 miles away. Um, and, you know, and then there were, you know, plus there were no notifications from Code Red or anybody like that about these evacuation notices to the local fire departments. And uh, is that one of the issues that is, uh, or are those one of the issues that are, that are being uh, dealt with uh, with the Code Red system? Yeah, uh, uh, I think your name is Dave um, uh, or, or Mr. Struggs. Um, I, I, yeah, I appreciate the question. And uh, uh, I, I'm not specifically sure when the alerts were coming in or what those actual alerts said. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, the Code Red system is an opt-in system. You actually have to register for it to get those alerts. So that may be the reason why some uh, of the residents were getting the alerts and some of them were not getting the alerts. Um, uh, specifically to the evacuations that occurred in the Boulder Creek area, um, uh, Chief Bingham uh, uh, and, and I and the sheriff, uh, we had that conversation about how the uh, evacuations were going to be affected and when they were going to be affected in Boulder Creek. And those were initiated on that uh, mutual conversation. So um, I don't know if the fire was 14 miles in advance, but uh, those evacuations were made uh, well in advance of that fire front. Um, as, as you were well aware, you, you would probably live in the, the valley here. It's not easy to get in and out of the valley. So part of our um, uh, um, methodology behind here was a systematic approach uh, starting from the very north uh, of, of the district and of the uh, county area uh, bordering the district uh, was to move into systematic approach from the north to the south, evacuating folks uh, to get them out of the valley in the, in the midst of the fire front uh, potentially approaching because we had gotten that word that that fire was moving towards uh, the south. So um, that's part of how that uh, that approach was driven. Uh, some of those code red, I'm not sure what those messages actually said, uh, but to answer that portion of the question uh, specifically is if you did not opt into that system, uh, you would not be getting the alerts. Thank you for the question. All right, we just have a few minutes left. Um, we will go to Mark Lee. Yes, hi, thank you for uh, presenting tonight. You guys uh, deserve an applause for organizing a defense for our community in San Lorenzo Valley. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the, the policy of Cal Fire for, uh, what is it, uh, uh, exit uh, roads that are out, uh, that are in areas that are uh, particularly in the sand hills that are controlled by private property owners and what kind of coordination you are working with them to keep um, those ex those uh, emergency exits open during the emergency period. Yeah, Mark, uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, uh, that, that is a, a common theme that we see um, uh, across the county. And uh, when we have uh, uh, residents that have uh, allowed for um, access roads to be across their property, um, you know, we try to work with them uh, for the areas that we do know and have those identified uh, to make sure that those roads are clear and that they're open and everybody can access them. Uh, there are some areas where a uh, property owners, a sale of a property and things like that occur where property owners do no longer want to have that available to the residents. So uh, really that's a, um, I have to defer back to our local fire protection districts uh, to make sure that they're, uh, you know, having that conversation to see what they can do to try to keep those areas open. Um, a lot of these areas, um, we rely on the local fire agencies um, for that, um, uh, helping us with that, with the property owners, because they have that uh, constant relationship with the community uh, that can help uh, um, facilitate that conversation. So. Um, I know in the midst of this fire, there were several areas uh, where we had to go back in and open up uh, uh, old fire roads uh, that had been uh, basically abandoned. Uh, and you know, that's one of the things uh, in the 90s, uh, we had significant cutbacks um, in our state budget where we lost uh, actual resources, where we would actually go out and maintain uh, these fire roads and the fire road gates and, and, uh, and do that kind of work every year. Uh, but due to budget cuts, um, that work hasn't been done for many, many years. And uh, that's something that um, is part of our um, planning processes uh, that we really need to look back at uh, to make sure that those uh, access roads are available uh, to the communities uh, and work with those property owners. Uh, 
So um, we don't have a specific policy uh, unless it was required for um, that development. And, and most of the time, unless it's uh, in the strict SRA uh, outside of a fire district um, where it would be like in our county fire area, we would have direct control over those areas. But if it's within a um, fire protection district, uh, that local fire district uh, would be the one that would really uh, have that um, uh, history of how that road got established, what it was uh, required uh, for the development, uh, or if it was just a neighborly uh, um, gesture that was done years and years ago. So, um, All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, sorry if we didn't have time to get to your question. We will be attempting to answer each question that remains in the uh, Q&A section of this Zoom call. We will also have questions uh, that you can submit uh, through the survey that you will get emailed and those questions that you email us directly. I just wanna say thank you for your questions and for your courtesy and professionalism uh, during this Q&A session. And I'll pass it back to Chief Larkin now for some closing comments. Yeah, I'll make this really quick because uh, we are out of time. Uh, I appreciate all of you spending the evening with us uh, to allow us to provide you information and uh, uh, allow you to answer questions uh, as well as us to try, try to provide those answers. Um, as we are, uh, uh, we are going to try to answer all the questions that did not get answered in the Q&A. Uh, I did provide you an email address as well as my office line that you can contact me directly if you have a specific item you would like to discuss with me. So uh, thank you very much and I hope you all have a great evening.